This podcast is brought to you by WRFL, Radio Free Lexington. Find us online at wrfl.fm. Catch us on your FM radio while you're in Central Kentucky at 88.1 FM, all the way to the left. Thank you for listening, and please be sure to subscribe. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to WRFL Lexington 88.1 FM, all the way to the left on your radio dial. This is Dr. Eric Weber here with you for another episode of Philosophy Bakes Bread. Today's episode is episode number 77 with Professor Brian Fry from our law school here at the University of Kentucky. And I hope you enjoy the show. It's about justifications for intellectual property and copyright law. Hope you enjoy. Thanks for listening to WRFL. And if you haven't already, head over to philosophybakesbread.com and learn how to subscribe to the show and reach out to us. We love to hear from you. Thanks for listening and enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to Philosophy Bakes Bread, food for thought about life and leadership. Philosophy Baked Bread is a production of the Society of Philosophers in America, a.k.a. SOFIA. I'm Dr. Eric Thomas Weber. And I'm Dr. Anthony Cascio. A famous phrase says that philosophy bakes no bread that is not practical, but we in SOFIA and on this show aim to correct that misperception. Philosophy Baked Bread airs on WRFL Lexington, 88.1 FM, and is distributed as a podcast next. Listeners can find us online at philosophybakesbread.com, and we hope you'll reach out to us on Twitter at philosophybb, on Facebook at Philosophy Bakes Bread, or by email at philosophybakesbread at gmail.com. Last but not least, you can leave us a short recorded message with a question or a comment or, you know, fluffy, nice, bountiful praise. We like that. <laughs> nice, nice and good that we may be able to play on the show. You can reach us at 859-257-1849. That's 859-257-1849. On today's show, we're super excited, as we always are, because we have a wonderful <laughs> guest, to talk with Professor Brian Fry of the College of Law at the University of Kentucky about justifying intellectual property and copyright law. That's right. Brian is the kindest person I connected with when I first came to the University of Kentucky, and I reached out to folks to get to know people. Early on, a few years ago, Brian invited me to come on his show on WRFL called The Bindle. And that airs in Lexington here. And, you know, he invited me to talk about my latest book, Uniting Mississippi, which had come out in the previous September. And in fact, it was Brian who said, you know, you should have a show on WRFL. So I got to give credit where credit is due. Philosophy Bakes Bread, as we now know it, is here because of Brian. So thank you. Let me first say thank you, Brian, my, for your my, inspiration. My pleasure. It's been such a it's been such a pleasure to see all of your success with this program and and at the University of Kentucky more generally. Well, thank you so much. Seriously, th- thank you. Thank you, Brian. Now you get to kind of pat yourself on the back and go, see, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, said, I, I was right. It's a good feeling. So everybody should know also that after earning his bachelor's degree at Berkeley, Brian went on to earn his MFA at the San Francisco Art Institute. That's pretty cool. That helps us under, kind of help us understand your background behind the sort of filmmaking and artistic radio DJing you do, I see. And after that, he earned his JD at NYU School of Law. So from one That's coast right. to the other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're going to ask you about that, you know, that connection. In, in preparations for this interview, I actually hadn't known yet that you had your MFA, Brian. And so uh-huh. I do think that explains or could explain some things. Maybe you disagree. I'm going to guess that it has also to do with your interest in intellectual property. But we'll let you tell us whether that's right or wrong sure. in this first segment that we call Know Thyself. Okay. Know Thyself. So, <laughs> Brian, we, we, we begin every episode wanting to get to know who we're talking to. We think it's important that everyone understand that philosophy is done by philosophers and that part of the philosophy kind of emerges from who the philosopher is or who the thinker is in your case. So we'd love to hear a little bit about your background, right? How, how it shaped who you are as a person, maybe how you got into, that's a big jump from, right, getting an MFA in San Francisco to, to jumping to NYU School of Law. So maybe you could tell us about that jump and tell us about yourself and your background and sort of how you became Brian Fry as you are now. Sure. Okay. So yeah, I grew up in, in Santa Rosa. I was born in San Francisco, grew up in Santa Rosa, California, in Sonoma County, wine country, and then was an undergraduate at the University of California, 
at at Berkeley where I did a dual major, well, major and minor in film history and in philosophy, actually. Uh, uh-huh. So I took philosophy classes at Berkeley with professors, in, including John Searle, among wow. others. Searle, nice. of course, has... His reputation has seen better days, but it was an interesting class regardless, his class on philosophy of language. But my main focus was on on film history and and film theory. And in particular, I was very interested in American avant-garde film. And mm-hmm. so when I graduated from UC Berkeley, I went to the San Francisco Art Institute where I did my MFA in in filmmaking, studying with some notable experimental filmmakers like Ernie Gear, George Kuchar, Martin Arnold, Janice Lipson, among oh, yeah. among many others. You think you think I could I'll pause you for half a second? What, what are some examples of, of American avant garde films that we could? For our listeners, if they were curious about what you're talking about, if they don't know yet. Right, right. So there's sort of a Good tradition. Question. Yeah, there's sort of a tradition of non-theatrical artistic filmmaking in the United States. Some of the early practitioners people might be familiar with would be someone like, for example, Maya Darren in the 1940s. People like Kenneth Anger, Jack Smith, Jonas Meckes. Stan Brackage was a well-known experimental filmmaker. So people making movies that are non-narrative, but also non-documentary. So films that are intended sort of to function more in a fine art context than in a traditional theatrical context. So I was very interested in that kind of filmmaking, both as a scholar and also as a programmer and, and film artist. So I, I kind of worked in that genre for many years. And when I graduated from the Art Institute, I then moved to New York City, where I lived on and off for about a decade. For about five years, I worked in kind of the art world in New York, including at the Museum of Modern Art and at the Whitney Museum, as well as Anthology Film Archives and the Filmmakers Cooperative. And in addition, with a friend of mine, I ran a weekly film series focused on experimental filmmaking for about four, four and a half years before wow. deciding to go. Yeah, it was called the Robert Beck Memorial Cinema. It was named named after a serviceman from the First World War who went deaf and dumb while in battle and was sent back to the United States. And while he was at the sanitarium, he watched a comedy film and started laughing and was miraculously cured of his deaf and dumbness. So wow. we named the wow, film. that's a heck of a story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We named the film series after him. And ir- ironically, there's actually a video artist who I was unaware of at the time, but his name was Robert Beck. And so when we named the film series at Robert Beck Memorial Cinema, there were a number of people who contacted me very distraught, wondering what had happened to, to Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Is he okay? <laughs> yeah, Mama was so mad at him. And I was like, look, lady, I mean, Robert Beck is a pretty common name. <laughs> yeah, there's probably a lot of Robert Becks out there. Yeah. That is funny. In, in any case, so after about five years living in New York, running that film series and making my own films and writing about film, I decided to go to law school. And I did my first year of law school at Georgetown and then transferred to NYU, where I focused primarily on on legal history, taking classes with scholars like Bill Nelson, John Philip Reed, Daniel Holsebosch, Sir John Baker, etc. And then clerked for two different judges, one on the Washington State Supreme Court and another on the Ninth Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and then came back to New York where I worked at Sullivan and Cromwell, which is a large, very large and old white shoe law firm in lower Manhattan, representing primarily investment banks and so on. A white shoe law firm? What is a white shoe law firm? Right. So it's kind of lingo among lawyers. The white shoe law firms 
are the ones that typically have been around for a long time and mm -hmm. uh, typically uh -huh. represent the kind of large institutional investment banks and and insurance companies and, and so on. All wear white shoes. <laughs> in, in the night in the nineteenth century, right. it was common for lawyers to wear like spats, basically, and I believe that that's where the term white shoe came from. It it, it actually has a a bit of an unfortunate history, insofar as through the Second World War, the white shoe law firms were extremely discriminatory, specifically discriminatory against Jews like myself. <laughs> and, and so actually, you know, many of the kind of subsequent law firms that were formed were actually forms, firms formed by Jews who were not accepted by the kind of dominant law firms of the day. And many of those Jewish law firms went on to become quite, quite successful among them, Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen and Katz, which is now like one of the most powerful law firms in, in New York City. But I, I, I digress. So I worked at Sylvan and Cromwell for a couple of years representing companies like Goldman Sachs and uh -huh. then left Sylvan and Cromwell to take a job teaching on a contract position at Hofstra Law School in Long Island, where I taught for a couple of years, and then was hired at the University of Kentucky in, in 2011 into my current into my current position. So I'm on year seven now at the University wow. of Kentucky. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Where I teach classes in intellectual property, copyright. I used to teach civil procedure. I'm going to be teaching professional responsibility. So like ethics, well, ethics-ish for lawyers. And I also teach some seminar classes in, in subjects like intellectual property theory and law and popular culture. Very nice. So that's, so, a, that's an amazing story. Oh, wait, go ahead, Eric. Sorry, I don't I've, got, I've got a question just because just you made this tr transition from mm -hmm. you know this kind of art world to going to, to law school in this path. This is mm -hmm. also my question. And, and and so did you feel you were dying a little bit inside leaving this art world and going into the legal world? And, and yeah, also you know, what kind of drove the jump? Yeah. Right. 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 Well, yeah. So, I mean, my friends were, my friends from kind of my art world days were a little surprised <laughs> by, <laughs> by my decision. Right. I think for my own part, I was, I was, I kind of had gotten what I wanted out of that and was nice. getting a little bored and was looking for something new and different and kind of a different challenge. And I'll be perfectly honest. I mean, I kind of went to law school by accident. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, as one does, oops. just walking down the street. Oops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the contract the, law kid. <laughs> yeah. The woman I was dating at the time had talked about going to law school and I kind of was casting around thinking about what to do what to do next and uh -huh. you know it was shortly after 9-11 which you know I was actually working as a temporary paralegal in New York City at the time and you know it caused me to reflect a little bit on what I was doing and and why I was doing it and going to law school seemed like a good healthy change for me. And it was actually a really great experience. I mean, I, I loved going to law school. I love being in law school. I really enjoy being a lawyer and a law professor. And in a lot awesome. of ways, it's given me the opportunity to do the kinds of work and scholarship that I wanted to do before going to law school, but just in a different context. So a lot of my scholarship focuses on art, and artists and issues related to art and artists. Um, Aha, so I was right. <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, there's, there's actually been a lot of nice, interesting crossover between sort of my personal previous interests and the work that I do now as, as a scholar. And, and in addition, it gives me the opportunity to help artists and and arts organizations. So I do awesome. a lot of pro, I do a lot of pro bono work, both for arts organizations, offering them institutional advice as well as assistance in applying for tax exempt status. And I also wow. represent individual artists who find themselves in in problematic situations, shall we say. <laughs> 
That is awesome. Very interesting. Before the end of the segment, which needs to happen soon, we have an important question that Anthony's going to ask you. Listen, uh, Brian, we ask this of, of everyone who comes on the show. You, you studied philosophy in undergraduate, and I imagine there's some yes. of the ideas there kind of kind of weaved in through your, your art and your, your legal career. And so mm-hmm. we're really curious. We, want to ask, we ask everyone this. What, what is philosophy? Ah, what is philosophy? I mean, I... I guess it depends on the context. Sure. <laughs> In this context, sure. what do you, I should make up. What do you think philosophy is? Maybe I'll put it that way. Does that help? Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, I guess I would say that philosophy is a structured way of thinking critically about meaning and ideas. Ooh. Perfect. I like it. Perfect. I nice love it. to see. That's fantastic. <laughs> Well, everybody, we're going to come back after a short break with the great Brian Fry. This is Eric Weber. My co-host is Anthony Cascio. Thank you for listening to Philosophy Bakes Bread. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone, to Philosophy Bakes Bread. This is Anthony Cascio and Eric Weber here talking today with Brian Fry about Justifying Intellectual Property and Copyright Law. In this second segment, we our plan is to ask you about justifications in general or in the abstract for intellectual property and copyright law, so some of the philosophy behind these sort of heady concepts. And then in the next segment, we'll ask you about how these sort of ideas apply to policy and to real life. Does that sound like a good plan? Sounds good to me. Actually, I think technically it is your plan since you proposed it. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed like a good one. Do you own the plan? How do we start there? <laughs> it's your idea. Do you own the plan? Uh, copyright doesn't protect ideas. So oh, no, no. Goodness. It, it, it's, a, it's a plan available to anyone who wants to use it. It's in the public domain. Uh-huh. Away, so, so a person does not own his or her ideas. That's one of the places we wanted to start. Sure. Is that correct? That, well, it depends. Right. Oh. So when we talk about intellectual property, it's actually kind of a, a catch-all phrase that refers to a bunch of different subjects, which really don't actually have all that much to do with each other. So sort of the paradigmatic forms of intellectual property are things like patents, copyrights, trademarks, trade secrets, rights of publicity, and so on. But all of those actually describe very, very different subject matter with totally distinct legal regimes governing them and fundamentally different purposes as well. So in in a funny way- What's an example of that difference, Brian? Like, like, you know, copyright versus, I don't know, trademark. Okay. So for one thing, all of those different forms of what we call quote unquote intellectual property protect very different kinds of things. Right. So patents are created in order to provide exclusive rights in inventions and discoveries. Copyrights are created in order to provide exclusive rights in original works of authorship. Trademarks are created in order to provide exclusive rights in distinctive marks. Trade secrets are created to provide exclusive rights in confidential information. And rights of publicity are created in order to provide exclusive rights in essentially the name or likeness of a a celebrity. But all of those Uh. exclusive rights are structured in very different ways and have really different purposes. Right. So there are uh-huh. certain cer- similarities between patents and copyrights insofar as the authority to create them is granted to Congress by the Constitution. But even patents and copyrights have really fundamental differences. Uh, and, and I think one way to characterize that would be that patents are granted in order to protect ideas and copyrights are granted in order to protect particular expressions of ideas, not the ideas ah. themselves. Right. And nice so th- difference. because the subject matter of these different forms of exclusive rights are so different, it can, it can often be really confusing for people to think about how they interact with each other and uh, quote unquote intellectual property scholars. And I, I, I like, I like to joke that, you know, you should never use the phrase intellectual property without putting scare quotes around it because it's really not a very helpful way <laughs> of, okay. of thinking about the relationship between these different kinds of exclusive rights that we create for very different kinds of of policy reasons. But many intellectual property professors rue the fact that in the popular media, 
people often confuse different intellectual property regimes in ways that would be comical if they weren't so profoundly misleading. Right? Can you give so an we'll example of about, that? Because yeah, like so for that we'll, we'll talk <laughs> about we'll talk about copyright when they're really talking about a trademark dispute. Even more absurdly, mix up things like patent and copyright, which really have nothing to do with each other at all. Or one that I often uh, kind of my 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 bugaboo as it were, is people will say things like, oh, so-and-so is accused of, of plagiarism, right? Plagiarism is not a cause of action, right? <laughs> I, copyright infringement is a cause of action, but there's no such thing as plagiarism in the law. Oh, goodness. So, so le- legally, there's none. Yeah. Interesting. Le- legally, legally, plagiarism is not a concept. And actually, I wrote, among other things, I wrote an article called Plagiarism is Not a Crime, pointing out I that, saw that, in fact... What we in academia refer to as plagiarism is often a form of kind of quasi-exclusive right that's explicitly not recognized by copyright law and actually prohibited constitutionally from being protected, right? So academic plagiarism norms, for example, say that you're not allowed to, for example, copy somebody's idea without attribution, but copyright law says it's perfectly fine. To copy someone's idea so out there. Brian, I have to ask for, for our audience. Imagine you've got someone who's like 14 years old, mm-hmm. isn't used to the word attribution, mm-hmm. and and hasn't heard the word plagiarism before. Mm-hmm. To, to that listener, what's, what's plagiarism? Well, you know, it really depends on who you talk to, right? Okay. Uh, one, one thing that I noted in my own scholarship is the fact that the concept of of plagiarism is highly contextual, and it often depends upon the discursive community to which you're talking. So different groups of people have very different concepts of what counts as improper copying without attribution or plagiarism in in different contexts. And so negotiating that, that question can often be quite difficult. And I think we often do it very poorly. And one thing that bothers me in, in particular is that in academia, we apply plagiarism norms developed for scholars to students for whom they don't always make very much sense. Right. Uh-huh. So in a, in a scholarly context, we as scholars have a vested interest in kind of developing a norm of, of attribution and citation because kind of the, the currency of scholarship is, is credit for what you've produced. But we apply those same rules to students, even though in many contexts, students might actually learn better by engaging in copying rather than reinventing the wheel all the time. And I think that's Mm. very troubling, right? Because we don't ask why we have the rules. We just apply them kind of mechanically. And the reality is that by doing so, we may actually be really disserving our students in many contexts, right? Because my position would be that if students can learn better and more effectively by engaging in certain forms of copying, then we should encourage them to engage in those forms of copying because our goal as professors is to help our students learn things. And applying plagiarism norms that prevent them from engaging in pedagogically beneficial behavior for no ultimate purpose, I think is a terrible mistake. So Brian, let me let me just express the simplest version of this idea for the 14-year-old who's entering high school mm-hmm. and is asked to turn in a paper and finds one online and prints it out and gives it to the teacher. Mm-hmm. I mean the the traditional idea is that when you turn in your writing and usually this is supposed to be made express that it's supposed to be you who has written something and you're taking someone else's work. You're not saying it's their work and you're pretending it's like, like it's yours and then you turn it in. Right. And so the teacher well, thinks there's a violation of the trust involved. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, I, it's, it's, I, 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 I can fail to see how I can just, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Brian. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's more complicated than that. In fact, okay. I, I would go so, so far as to say that I don't actually think it's possible for students to plagiarize in any meaningful sense. I think students can cheat, right? But I, 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 because students are producing work that is not intended for publication, typically, I actually think using the word plagiarism is a misnomer. 
And okay. it's actually, it actually confuses the way we think about what we want to accomplish. So right? what would so you when, say that 14 year old's doing when he or she da- takes a paper, turns it in with his name on it? Right. And so it's, not, it's, I, usually, I, it's, it's not copying as in copying it down. They just go through and they control C and copy and paste. There's no like learning going on. It's just right. like how to quickly copy from Wikipedia. That's usually right. my experience. Right. Right. So I think that the, the problem there is that the student is engaging in f- a form of fraudulent behavior with respect to their professor, specifically okay. they're, they're, they're cheating, right? They're, they're right, not exactly. doing the work that they were supposed to do. Yeah. Ironically, right. Our response or rather the reason that we don't want the students to just copy and paste is because we fear that just copying and pasting is not going to provide them with the appropriate learning experience. Right. It seems to me that if what we're concerned about is maximizing learning experiences, then the appropriate response is not to severely punish or expel a student, but help them understand that they're not accomplishing learning when they oh, do that. Oh, absolutely. I agree um, with that. And so I'm very troubled by the response to what people refer to as plagiarism, but I'm even more troubled by the fact that people don't think critically about what they're trying to what they're trying to do, nice. right? So we see a, a kind of plagiarism creep, as it were, where, you know, obviously I agree that simply copying and pasting uh, previously existing material is not a learning experience for a student. But what about the student who copies and pastes from a bunch of different sources and assembles them into a piece of writing in a meaningfully pedagogically effective fashion? Right. Ah. Should the fact that they have copied and pasted rather than generating everything anew be a punishable, be a punishable offense? If in fact producing a work of authorship in that way was a pedagogically beneficial experience for, for the student. Right. So, so kind of like mean, making my, my, a yeah, my point is like we should be thinking about what we want to accomplish. And what if, if what we want to accomplish is learning, then we should be creating rules that encourage learning not rules that punish arbitrary behavior simply because we've defined it as as bad without asking why we want to stop it. This maybe is a little bit more fundamental question. Maybe I'm worried it's almost too big of a question because it maybe it comes back to the idea of plagiarism and what counts as stealing and, and, and theft. So I know intellectual property is maybe not the proper term, but it is kind of a big right. concept. We put scarecrows mm-hmm. around it, but it uses the term property. Mm-hmm. And everyone kind of has an instinctive idea of what property is. But what I find when I teach about property, for instance, I'm teaching like John Locke and we're talking about property. Not everyone kind of has the kind of an instinctual idea of what it is, but they can't really define it. So maybe the question is, what is property and like what makes sort of intellectual property and everything that kind of fits under that umbrella sort of different from other types of property, like real estate property? Yeah, that, 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 that's a it's great too big question. Of a question. Okay. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question, actually. It's a really fundamental question that intellectual property scholars are grappling with right now. And in fact, I think kind of the consensus among most people who study intellectual property is that we shouldn't call it that at all. And in fact, property is a metaphor that's not very helpful for thinking about ah, the nature oh boy, of the subject okay. matter and what we're trying to what we're trying to accomplish and in fact many people prefer the term knowledge goods to talk about the kind of constellation of different forms of exclusive rights that we typically put in the basket that we call intellectual property and hmm. a lot of scholars fear that using a property metaphor to talk about knowledge goods causes us to think improperly about the nature of the exclusive rights in question and the kind of policy goals we're trying to achieve by creating those exclusive rights in in the first place. So how does so, how does how does the idea of property then take us off the track? Well okay so so so, so one one fundamental problem with using the property metaphor is that it's created in the context of what we would call uh, rivalrous goods, right? When we think of physical property, we're typically talking about goods that are reduced by consumption. And that's not typically the case with, exactly. with knowledge goods, specifically with respect to the, the subject matter of patents and copyrights. So patents protect ideas, copyrights protect particular expressions of ideas, and neither of those are rivalrous. You know, 
an infinite number of people can consume an idea without reducing the supply of that idea. So that's what you mean by they're not rivalrous. In other words, it's not that there's only 10 of something. And if I want five of them, you can't have six of them, right? You're saying we can each have as many copies of something as we want. Kind of that, 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 that's right. And and it's a reason. So Anthony used the word theft earlier and theft is an, is another metaphor that a lot of intellectual property scholars really resist because it's actually not possible to steal the subject matter of intellectual property. You can't steal an idea. You can't uh-huh. steal an expression of an idea. You can infringe it, but it's only infringement because we've chosen as a policy matter to create those exclusive rights in the first place, right? Unlike physical property, when you steal it, you know, you're, you're, it, it's rivalrous. You're taking something that belongs to someone else. And when you take it, they don't have it anymore, right? If I take your wallet, you don't have your wallet, right? But if I use, or read or experience a expression of an idea that you created, it doesn't diminish the, the quantity of that expression that's still available. I haven't taken anything from you other than your exclusive right to profit from, from the, from the sale or well, use. I have about a hundred more questions, yeah, but it, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately we have to wrap up this segment and we're going to bring some of those questions forward to the next segment. Thanks everybody for listening to Philosophy Bakes Bread. This is Eric Weber. My co-host is Anthony Cascio, and we've been sitting on the edge of our seats listening to Brian Fry. We'll be right back after a short break. If you're hearing this, that means podcast advertising works. WRFL is now accepting new applications for advertising in a selection of our original podcast series. If you or someone you know owns a business in Central Kentucky and would be interested in advertising on WRFL's original podcast, please email development at wrfl.fm. Welcome back, everyone, to Philosophy Bakes Bread. This is Anthony Cascio and Eric Weber talking today with Brian Fry about justifying intellectual property and copyright law. We might change that. Should we change it to justifying knowledge goods and copyright law? (laughs) I like that. So in the second segment, we we talked about sort of some general or abstract justification of property law. We talked about plagiarism a little bit. That was exciting for me a lot. Very exciting. In the sex segment, Eric and I are sort of chomping at the bits. We have we have so, some follow up questions. Brian left us hanging by the seat of our pants, and so we have some <laughs> some follow up questions. And then we're gonna we're gonna talk about sort of how these ideas work in practice. So Brian, you, 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 at the in the very end of the last segment, you you were talking about how it's sort of not possible to steal an idea, but it's possible to infringe upon it, and we can only infringe upon it because of the policies that we've created, and so. I guess there's two kind of questions here. What is the motivation for the creation of these policies then? And then sort of along with that, what are the justifications for then the intellectual property laws? Right. So, you know, as with so many other kinds of normative spheres, there's really kind of two competing theories of why intellectual property protection is created in the first place. And broadly speaking, we can talk about them as consequentialist and deontological justifications for, for the creation of intellectual property. So, so, so so there's three words that people may not all know. One of them is normative. One of them is (laughs) deontological and one of them is utilitarian. Yeah. Right. So when I say normative, I briefly, why is it a good thing or the right thing? to do good words the norms yeah yeah the, about the norm, why is it a norm? Why, yeah. Do we, why do we think this is justified perfect when i talk about consequentialist i'm talking about a normative theory that says that actions are justified if they produce good outcomes right so good. in other words we do, we do th- uh, it would be a theory that it's right to do something if doing that thing makes people better off you might win a prize for the most succinct and clear explanations of things. Okay, and I got I got to hear this about deontological. Yeah, that's see if we can do it for that's the okay. test. The hard okay. one. This, this is the test. So deontological justifications uh, essentially say that things are an action is right because it's good in and of itself, right? So it's it, it, it's a distinction between okay. saying that we should do something because it produces good outcomes versus position saying that we should do something because it's the right thing to do. Even uh, if there are bad outcomes. Even if there are bad outcomes. Yeah, it's Im- the, the intention Im- behind Im- it. Yeah. Im- implicitly, even if there are bad outcomes. Although I would suggest that 
many people who adopt deontological positions sort of leave out the last part because they want to they want to believe that deontological claims are also consistent with consequentialist claims, although it isn't necessarily the case that that's true. And in fact, implicitly, if you're adopting something for deontological reasons, you have to be saying that it doesn't matter whether it produces bad outcomes or good exactly outcomes. Exactly right. Which, you know, I think is an interesting tension between the two so, so, and reflects a kind yeah. of consistent tension in many problems in moral philosophy. In fact, I think it's the reason that, for example, trolley problems are interesting, right? Right. They reflect the tension between people's consequentialist and deontological heuristics. So so really briefly, everybody, remember, it's if you're barreling down a hill in a trolley and you might hit five people, but have a chance to flip over to another lane where you'd only hit one, should you do it? And that's that's very the the fastest explanation I give for the trolley problem. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. So, okay. So you were right. telling us about how these kinds of reasoning might have something to do with policies about, you know, protection of these intellectual goods. That's right. That's right. Exclusive right. rights to intellectual goods. So how, how do you see those you yeah, know, factoring so the sort in? Of, the sort of predominant or prevailing explanation or theory for the justification of the creation of intellectual property rights, specifically of, of patents and copyrights is that it's justified to create copyright and patent protection because doing so produces good outcomes, specifically that it encourages people to make more of things that we want that that they wouldn't otherwise make. So it's essentially a, a kind of a variant on public goods economics. We look at ideas and expressions of ideas as public goods because they are non-rival. In other words, consumption doesn't diminish supply. And as with any other form of public good, we're concerned about potential market failures caused by caused by free riding, right? In other words, if a good is non-rival and non-excludable, in other words, if you can't force people to pay for it, people will have a tendency to consume without paying the marginal cost of production. And as a consequence, there is a disincentive to create the market clearing quantity of that good. In other words, you're not going to be able to satisfy demand for the good in question. You're going to see an underproduction or you risk seeing an underproduction of the good in question. And in theory, we can solve those market failures or at least some of those market failures by creating exclusive rights, which enable the, the, the marginal producers of ideas and expressions of ideas of patentable and copyrightable subject matter to internalize some of the positive externalities associated with those goods in question. So, so Brian, in that regard, you mentioned how things are different. One, and, and this is sort of testing both the question of justification and application that we're going to get to here in this segment. Mm-hmm. You know, my understanding is that if I copyright, let's say, a book I've written, you know, I think that copyright is protected ownership of its exclusive rights to copy and so whatever and so forth, I think until 50 years after I'm dead, if I'm not mistaken. But whereas if I were to patent something, it's only like a certain number of years, 12 years or 14 years or something. Right. Why the difference? Well, so so uh, two points I would make. Um, first off, copyright's not a verb, right? You, oh, okay. you, actually, you actually can't meaningfully copyright something because oh copyright, okay. copyright copyright comes into existence as soon as you fix an original work of authorship. In so technically you year. register a copyright, right? Yeah. So you can register a copyright with the copyright office, but that's merely essentially a, mini- a ministerial act on the part of the copyright office. They look at the so work and prove that it's yours, right? Sort of, right? So what would happen when you register a work of authorship for copyright protection is essentially you would be making a representation to the copyright office that you had created the work of authorship in question and that you believe it is the subject matter of copyright. The work, the copyright office will review the work in question and then either register or refuse to register the work in question right. based on whether or not they accept or believe your claim to be the author and whether or not it constitutes copyrightable subject matter. In other words, if it has original content, that would be the subject of copyright protection. But the copyright comes into existence as soon as you fix the work of authorship in a tangible medium. Right. So you, right. Can't, you can't really say you're copywriting something because it becomes protected by copyright simply by virtue of you expressing that idea 
in a tangible medium. In other words, so if, you, if you've never down. registered for it for copyright, that's not a problem so long as when question comes, right. you can prove you know, when you have right. created or, or that you created it before it's used elsewhere or something like Anything that. Anything right? that you fix in a tangible medium is automatically protected by copyright. So as uh, is my this, friend is this Gra- why has, people used to write themselves yeah. letters and mail it to themselves with their well, idea? Well, it's, com- compl- it, it's complicated. It used to be that registration was necessary or more necessary for copyright protection. But when the Copyright Act was revised in 1976, it, it, shifted to a position consistent with the Berne Convention, so sort of European copyright law more broadly, which provided that copyright comes into existence as soon as a work of authorship is fixed in a tangible medium. So as my friend Brad Greenberg likes to say, under the 1976 Act, copyright is like an Oprah Winfrey giveaway. Everybody gets one, Um, (laughs) right? Every, Every email you write Every mm-hmm. social media post, every you Instagram get a copyright. Photo, you get a copyright. Every single one is automatically protected by copyright as soon as you create it, for better or for worse, right? Oh, so, all, all my Twitter posts are copyrighted. That's absolutely right. Every single oh, thing boy. you post on Twitter <laughs> is protected by copyright. Um, <laughs> now, of course, you you give certain you know you agree to license those works in certain ways by virtue of the Twitter terms of service, for example. Right. But see, right. this get, this gets into a really fundamental problem, though, with our consequentialist justification for copyright protection, right? So I'll just kind of take a little bit of a shift and say, yeah. let's, let's just look at copyright in terms of thinking about justification. So if, if, you, if you recall, on our consequentialist justification, what we say is we create copyright protection because we think it makes us better off. How does it make right. us better off? Well, on the margins, giving people copyright protection encourages them to create works of authorship that they wouldn't otherwise create, right? So our, th- our consequentialist theory of copyright protection is that the reason we grant copyright is that we think we get something in exchange for it. In other words, by, by giving people copyright protection, we provide them with an incentive on the margins to produce more works of authorship, which we value. Right. And therefore, as a whole, we're better off, even though we lose certain rights that we would otherwise have to use those works of authorship by virtue of giving the authors exclusive rights to reproduce, distribute, perform, and display those works of authorship. The, the obvious problem there, however, is that that's an empirical claim, right? Which can be tested. Right. And by implication, right? If copyright is justified because it makes us better off, right? Well, it follows by necessary implication that copyright is not justified to the extent that it doesn't make us better off. And I think it's, it's, uh-huh. it's, it's pretty hard to make a case that giving people copyright protection for the duration of their natural life plus an additional 70 years after their death is not providing a salient incentive for people to, for example, make Instagram posts or Facebook status updates, right? So to the extent we want to evaluate the justification for copyright protection under a consequentialist theory, it's really hard to make a case for a consequentialist justification for protecting many of those kinds of works of authorship, because it's Uh pretty clear that people are not creating them in response to a salient copyright incentive. In fact, as I think you just demonstrated, most people don't even realize that they own the copyright in the first place, right? Right. It can hardly be salient if they don't even know they have it. Yeah, this is, this is news to me. And right. So this is a problem. And so for, you know, for me as a copyright scholar with a tendency to take a consequentialist position, as I do more, more broadly in, in moral philosophy, you know, for better, or for worse, people can certainly disagree about that general perspective. But I think that to the extent you take a consequentialist perspective on, on cop, on the justification of copyright protection, it's very hard to justify copyright doctrine as it currently exists. So I'm the kind of person who tends to think that like, look, for some authors creating some works, it's pretty clear that copyright is in fact a salient incentive um, and does in fact encourage people to create certain kinds of works of authorship. However, right, it, it... you have to distinguish between when it matters and when it doesn't matter. And then if we're serious about adopting a consequentialist justification, we really ought to think hard about what copyright doctrine looks like and how we might tweak it in order to make it more efficient 
at generating the kinds of positive outcomes that well i've got a question about that exactly brian because my understanding is and this isn't necessarily about copyright but but maybe more about patents i I don't know you tell me Mm -hmm. isn't it true that most research and development investment in the pharmaceuticals goes into being able to slightly modify and you know some sort of drug or, or or formula so that they can extend the life of ownership protections or or you know, exclusive rights to profit, whatever you want to call it, for these medicines. Instead of putting money that will benefit us all by developing a new discovery, people find some slight way to change a drug that we all buy for more money than we need to, right? So that so that they can keep profiting longer. It's like that's where the money is. And from a consequentialist standpoint, wouldn't that be wrong? Negative. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it's complicated. <laughs> and in fact, well, I'd say so. <laughs> sure. like a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a um, lawyer for you. <laughs> and I would say that, you know, yeah, there's a, lo- there's a lot of disagreement about how to think about the scope of patent protection and whether or not it's justified. And there's been a lot of scholarship looking at specifically the pharmaceutical industry from the perspective of sort of the incentives and efficiency associated with patenting in that sphere. You know, I'm not an expert in, in pharmaceutical patents, but, you know, the scholarship that I've read, I think suggests that in fact, there, you know, Patents do provide salient incentives to pharmaceutical companies. It sure. seems as if patents may be more efficient in the context of the pharmaceutical industry than they are in some under- other industries, for example, computing and, and software specifically. That said, I think there are structural features of the pharmaceutical industry that can create perverse incentives or inefficient incentives Uh for companies with respect to perverse uh, is a good word product development. And, 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 you know, obviously these are, these are for profit companies that are chasing the largest profits that they can recover. I'm not sure that the problem there is necessarily the patent system so much as the patent system as instantiated within a particular highly regulated capital intensive industry. So uh, I, I certainly agree that there is legitimate room for concern about the use and pursuit of patents in the pharmaceutical industry. But I think the problem is a complicated policy issue that does not necessarily admit to any kind of simple one factor solution. Yeah. Okay. Well, once again, I am made of questions and want to keep talking with you, Brian, but this is a very good sign that this is a good episode. (laughs) And so everybody, thank you for listening to Philosophy Bakes Bread. This is Eric Weber. My co-host is Anthony Cascio. We've been talking with the great Brian Fry. We'll be right back after a short break. Welcome back, everyone, to Philosophy Bakes Bread. This is Anthony Cascio and Eric Weber, and today we've been having a really exciting conversation with Brian Fry about justifying intellectual property and copyright law, or knowledge goods, as we may be. We'll start the trend here, Brian. We'll, we'll start changing things. <laughs> on the at, at the very least, put the, put the air quotes in. Yes. Like intellectual it. property. You can't see it, but I'm... I'm <laughs> yeah, me, me doing air quotes. In this last segment, we'll have a, a few big picture questions. We actually have a lot even more quick questions for Brian. We'll ask him about the inspiration for the show, maybe tell a few jokes and kind of wrap up with a nice question for us all to think about and chew on as we go about the day's business. So that's right. In the last segment, we were talking about sort of just different justifications for intellectual property policy, right? why we have these different policies. Yeah. And, and you mentioned there was consequentialist approaches, and which is to say we're looking at the consequences of these laws. And there are deontological approaches, which is to say we're looking at the laws, I guess, insofar as they are good in themselves. And we kind of laid out some of the consequentialist approaches, but what about the deontological? Can you remind yeah. us about that? Yeah. So, so the prevailing approach among intellectual property scholars is the consequentialist approach. But as I, I noted in the last segment, right, there are 
there's a lot of practical questions about whether what intellectual property policy looks like actually tracks very well with what it would in theory look like under a actual consequentialist approach. And the reality is, I think that most lay people specifically, actually, I think, tend to have a more deontological heur heuristic when it comes to intellectual property protection. What's a heuristic? Yeah. yeah so it kind of... They tend to think about intellectual property protection from a rights-based framework, right? They have a way – people tend to think that intellectual property ownership, literary ownership, ownership of ideas or exclusive rights and inventions, for example, are something that people deserve, not something that we give right. them in order to produce – in order to produce good outcomes. And there's sort of a few different kind of classic frameworks that people use for thinking deontologically or in a rights-based fashion when it comes to intellectual property. One is what's typically referred to as a Lockean approach. So the famous philosopher John Locke argued that people have a natural right to own the fruits of their labor. And so the idea from a Lockean perspective would be that authors and inventors are entitled to exclusive rights in the works of authorship and inventions that they produce because those works of authorship or invention are the product of that author or inventor's labor. And therefore, they have, from a Lockean perspective, a, a natural right, as it were. Right. To, I to wrote ownership. the song, it's my song. I painted yeah, that, wrote the book, exactly, it's my exactly book, right. that kind of idea. That, that, that's right. That's right. And then the alternative approach that's also common would be a kind of more Kantian or Hegelian way of thinking about the moral justification for intellectual property ownership, sort of rooted in the idea that people deserve to have certain forms of exclusive rights or certain forms of ownership or control over the works of authorship they generate specifically to a lesser degree in Inventions because they need that exclusive right in order to fully realize their autonomy and uh, to control expressions of of their personality, right? So these kind of like ideas that that people deserve to be able to control how specifically works of authorship that they generate are used because those works of authorship reflect back on themselves and the values that they associate. Is this maybe where you, you'll hear your heel arguments online? Like, you know, someone has posted something on Instagram, someone else steals their picture and then starts reposting it. And it's sort of like, well, yes, you've stolen my identity, sort of part of work. I, not just work I did, but who I am. I think that's right. I think people have a kind of intuitive and socially reinforced sense of entitlement to control things that they produce in mm. particular kinds of ways. And that's, I think, it's kind of self-reinforcing, right? So w when within a particular discursive community, you see people naming and enforcing these concepts of the kinds of control that that community has sort of internally determined to be justified, people come to believe that they have and should have particular rights to control the things that they produce in particular ways, irrespective of the consequence of producing those rights. So from hey, a you don't want someone go on. Sorry. Yeah. So from a descriptive standpoint, right, although the consequentialist theory of intellectual property is the prevailing theory of justification among intellectual property scholars. I think from a descriptive standpoint, in many respects, the deontological theories better reflect the way that policymakers and citizens <laughs> actually think about why intellectual property exists in the first place. So there's, there's a bit of a, theoretic, a theoretical tension there. Well, so, so you mentioned earlier that, you know, you, you, we don't... You, there's a concern about the, the metaphor of property itself kind of being misleading about how the laws work. And I think this is a good example because, you know, you've laid it out. I'm like, you know, you're right. I, I own this, this book I wrote. I own my own image. Someone took my picture and started spreading around. I'm like, what are you doing with it? That's mine. And so we have this, this idea of property. And so you're saying that's just is misleading. Like, this isn't how it works. Well, I, 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 I mean, I, I'm not sure I would say it's misleading. I would say that it is potentially unwise. <laughs> 
right? So to the extent that we think that the justification for creating these policies in the first place is and should be consequentialist, by virtue of adopting deontological or kind of morality-based exclusive rights in works of authorship, for example, we risk potentially producing policy results that are inconsistent with our ostensibly consequentialist goals. In other words, we might end up producing bad results. And one way specifically that can happen is sort of this internal tension in in copyright and in, in copyright theory and and doctrine, which is that, you know, in, in a sense, you could characterize the justification for copyright protection as being that, you know, we create copyright in order to encourage people to speak. In other words, we create copyright because we think that by creating copyright, we will facilitate the creation of more and better speech. The problem is that we facilitate the creation of more and better speech by enabling private actors, i.e. authors, to prevent others from speaking, right? So there's this in- inherent, in- in- intrinsic sort of First Amendment free speech-based tension in creating copyright in in the first place, right? Because we're trying to encourage something by enabling people to prevent it. Well, we, we have some... We have some more questions to ask you, but we're actually short on time for the rest of the segment. And so we have an idea about asking you something afterwards that we might, if there's enough time, we might ask you and and include in what we call a short breadcrumb episode. But one, just if you could tell me in like a sentence or two, you know, in anticipation of our philosophy funnies, who owns jokes? (laughs) Really, it's an interesting question and it depends. Right. So <laughs> in in theory, copyright can only protect original works of authorship. So it can only protect particular expressions of an idea, not the idea itself. The problem is when it comes to kind of short expressions of which jokes are kind of a typical example, it can be hard to distinguish between the idea and the particular expression. In copyright scholarship, we refer to this as the quote unquote merger doctrine, right? When the idea and the expression merge together. So the question becomes, you know, how substantial or how specific does the language of a joke have to be before it becomes what we would term a literary work that would be protectable? By right, by because when someone else tells it, there will be a few words different. I see. That's right. That's right. That's right. But, you know, some jokes are so simple or so straightforward that there's really only one way of telling it. Like one of my favorites, this is sort of a meta joke, as it were. So it's All right. uh, a skeleton walks into a bar and says, give me a beer and a mop. Um, <laughs> you know, there's, really only one, <laughs> there's really only one way to tell that joke, which I like yeah. because it's a joke in which the setup is also the punchline. So you know, the question would be, is that joke sufficiently substantial that there is a particular expression that could be protected by copyright without infringing or without limiting the rights of others to be able to express the concept of that joke in in their own terms, right? So recently there was actually a dispute over someone who had come up with a joke, I believe it was about Tom Brady, the football player, and something about like how the, the dispute over Deflate Gate or whatever. Deflate Gate, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. And the question was, you know, whether the essentially the punchline of the joke was something that could be protected under the circumstances. And I think courts really struggle with those kinds of questions because, you know, the subsequent telling was not necessarily attributed to the originator of the joke in the way that that social norms of comedy might have suggested would be appropriate. The question is whether or not that should constitute a copyright infringement or not. And and in practice, right, a lot of social groups develop their own kind of quasi-intellectual property norms for precisely that reason. So stand-up comedians are one great example. Chris Sprigman and Dotan Oliar, no, uh, Chris Sprigman and yeah, I think it is Dotan Oliar, did, wrote a great paper talking about social norms around joke stealing among among stand-up comedians. And we mm. could tell a, a similar story, right, about, for example, plagiarism norms among 
academics, right? Uh So academics create plagiarism norms precisely in order to create a form of quasi intellectual property in, in forms of expression that are expressly excluded by copyright protection, specifically, right? Attribution norms around ideas, for example, right? So among academics, right? Plagiarism norms are understood to prohibit copying somebody's idea without attributing that idea to them. Well, in copyright doctrine, there's a no such thing as an attribution requirement, right? Something either infringing or non-infringing and attribution has no effect on that. And copyright specifically does not and constitutionally cannot protect ideas, right? So, so scholars create plagiarism norms precisely uh-huh. in order to create a form of quasi property right in something that as a broader policy matter, we've actually decided is not a right that's going to be protected. All right. Well, we're going to get to those jokes in just two seconds. <laughs> Maybe we've stolen them. Now I'm going to be worried. I think we're okay. But we do, we do ask a, you know, one final kind of bigger question, philosophy question of everyone it comes from the inspiration for our show. Would you say, Brian, that philosophy bakes no bread, as the famous saying goes, or that it does? Why and how? And maybe, you know, is philosophy useful? Ah, yes. Well, I, I think that from the perspective of a lawyer and a legal scholar, thinking philosophically about what the law is for is critical to achieving the purpose of Uh the law. So I think it's actually that in some sense, philosophy is essential because we don't have laws for their own sake. We have laws in order to accomplish things. And philosophy helps us identify what we want the law to do. And I don't think you can do good legal scholarship without asking, why are we doing this in the first place? (laughs) That's fantastic. That's good. I like it. That's really good. Absolutely. Yeah, right on. Well, as as you know, Brian, we want to make sure people see both the serious side of philosophy as well as the lighter side. So we've got a bit okay. in this last segment that we call Philosophunnies. Say, okay. Philosophunnies. 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 Say, Philosophunnies. Philosophunnies. So, so Brian, we want to know if you've got a funny joke or a story to tell us, either about intellectual property or about theft or about any of these related concepts we've been talking about. Have you got a funny joke or a story to tell? Well, I can I can tell you my one of my favorite jokes growing up, or my my favorite series of jokes were, and I didn't even realize this at the time, but it was by a comedy duo in California called Renfro and Jackson. They have something they call the the Elephant Game, uh-huh. uh, which I I actually got a record of a little while. I found it just randomly, and so it was a series of jokes that went something along the lines of, um, you know, what did Tarzan say when he saw elephants coming over the hill? I don't know what. He said, look, elephants coming over the hill. What did he say? What, what did Tarzan say when he saw elephants coming over the hill with sunglasses on? I don't know. What did he say? He didn't, he didn't, he didn't say anything. He didn't recognize him. <laughs> what did Tarzan, what did, what, why do elephants have flat feet? What is that? From jumping out of trees. Yeah. Why do elephants have wrinkly skin? What is that? Have you ever tried to iron an elephant? Um, <laughs> so there's what, a, whole, a, a whole series of these kind of absurdist, quote unquote, jokes about elephants, which are funny only because the punchline has no coherent relationship to <laughs> the I the like premise. it. I, 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 I wonder good. whether the name Tarzan is trademarked and we're not allowed to use it. <laughs> I think it's probably yeah. uh, it, it, Hey, why do you ever been, see it? Oh, it probably has been registered, although I would caution that much like copyright, trademark is also not a verb. All right, a, right, right. <laughs> a trademark comes into existence as soon as a mark is distinctive to habits are hard to break, Brian. <laughs> so you can register a trademark, but you can't create one. As my friend, as my friend Ed, Ed Timberlake put it, trademarks are the most poetic form of intellectual property because their meaning is determined by the understanding of the public. Right, so the trademark huh. is in the eye of the beholder, sort of like a, a, a death of trademark, as it were. Death, it's only, death. It's sort sort of like the way Roland Barth talked about the the death of the author, in the sense right. that the meaning of a work is generated by its audience. The meaning of a mark is generated by the public that attributes meaning to it. Whoa, that makes sense, and that's that's pretty profound. I like yeah. it. <laughs> 
like well, it. Yeah. For each episode, Anthony and I gather, uh, you know, some dumb jokes too, <laughs> just to add a little dessert at the end. Do you want to tell this first one, Anthony? I'm gonna tell another one too. All right. Why do you ever see elephants hiding in trees? Why is that? Because they're so good at it. <laughs> I like it. See, you can play the <laughs> elephant game. <laughs> Rent, Rent uh, and Jackson would be pleased. <laughs> uh, all right. Do you want to tell the next one, Eric? Sure. So Mook, a big sort of caveman, you know, he's regretting, you know, having invented after inventing fire. He says he sees others sitting down in front of their own fires. He says to Glog, dang, I should have taken out a patent first. <laughs> oh, my goodness. We came up with a, law- a lawyer joke or two first. <laughs> <laughs> A lawyer joke or two as well. So how many lawyer jokes are in existence? I don't know. How many? Only three. All the rest are true stories. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What do you call a thousand lawyers at the bottom of the ocean? <laughs> I don't know what. <laughs> a job well start. done. A good start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Anthony, I... I, I I think Brian takes the cake on that one. Yeah, that was good. We, we, a lot of them were kind of mean spirited, the lawyer jokes. So I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. So, all right. Well, we have just enough time for our last segment before we wrap everything up. And we like to take advantage today of the fact that we have powerful social media that allows for intercommunication, even for programs like radio shows, two pro, two-way communication. So we want to invite our listeners to send us their thoughts about big questions that we raise on the show. That's right, Brian. So given that, do you have a question to ask our listeners for future segments that we call You Tell Me? Have you got a question for them? For sure. Well, I... I the question that I would have would relate to the subject matter of today's show. Specifically, we've talked a lot about different justifications for intellectual property, specifically the, this kind of tension between consequentialist and deontological justifications. And I wonder if listeners would reflect on their own thoughts about intellectual property and specifically copyright protection and ask themselves why they think that copyright protection is justified if if it's justified at all right on fascinating question that is a good question and we're looking forward to hearing your answers why do you think copyright protection is justified if it is at all right all right good deal well thanks everyone for listening to this episode of philosophy bakes bread your host anthony cashew and eric weber are really grateful today to have been joined by brian fry and we hope you listeners will join us again. Consider sending us your thoughts about anything you've heard today that you'd like to hear about in the future or specific questions we've raised for you. That's right, folks. Remember that you can catch us on Twitter, Facebook, and on our website at philosophybakesbread.com. And there you'll find transcripts for many of our episodes thanks to Drake Bowling, an undergraduate philosophy student at the University of Kentucky. Thank you, Drake. Thank you, Drake. And thanks Ooh, also to Eric, Stephen. Eric, go ahead. Can, we, can we jump on and say, if you go there, you'll also find uh, an increasing number of what we're calling one sheets, little short discussion sort of Good point. Uh, guidelines that go along with some of our episodes. We're going to be increasing those as well. Something pretty cool that I'm excited about. That's right. That's for local communities of philosophical conversation, which is what Sophia is trying to build to use to be able to quickly and easily have a fun conversation about these topics that we're talking about on the show. So thanks. Thanks for pointing that out, Anthony. And thanks yeah. to Stephen Barrera, a recent graduate from the University of Kentucky, f- who has been helping us some with the preparations for the show. Thank, Thank you, Stephen. Stephen. And one more for the... Go ahead. I was going to say maybe for your website, I can send you some links to some supplemental materials and examples of things we've talked about. I love it. We'll put it in the show notes. Absolutely. That'd be great. Yep. Perfect. One more thing, folks. If you want to support the show and be more involved in the work of the Society of Philosophers in America, the easiest thing to do is to go consider joining as a member at philosophersinamerica.com. And if you're enjoying the show, we hope you'll take a second to rate and review us wherever you're listening to us today on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, YouTube, wherever you're finding us. You know, a good review helps us reach more people, helps us to bake more bread. You know, yep. spread the good word, so to speak. And of course, you can always email us at philosophy bakes bread, and that's all one word, at gmail.com. And you can also call us and leave a short recorded message with a question or a comment that we may be able to play on the show. You can reach us at 859 257 1849. Brian, thank you so much for joining us today. I've had an absolutely wonderful conversation. Absolutely. Yeah.
Likewise. My pleasure. My pleasure. Anytime. Thank you, Brian. We hope you will join us again, maybe in the future. And it goes for our guests as well. I hope you guys will join us again next time on Philosophy Bakes Bread, food for thought about life and leadership. If you're enjoying this podcast from WRFL Lexington, you may enjoy our live radio stream at WRFL.FM and, of course, via radio at 88.1 FM in the central Kentucky area. We have a wide variety of programs you're sure to enjoy. Just go to WRFL.FM slash schedule and see what programs appeal most to you. Thanks again for listening to this podcast from WRFL Lexington.